welcome again those who are joining us for the first time hope you will continue to uh, maintain interest and spread the good word around good word around especially if you like this um now this is the fifth today in our series of resilience talks and we have a fantastic lineup of speakers uh the topic today as you know is the role of non technical skills in a crisis and we have mr simon patterson brown mr uh, sorry professor steven yule and dr nathan smith uh, i will introduce them in due course formally uh, just some ground rules to start with so this is an hour long session and uh, we expect the formal talk to last about 30 minutes today alongside there you probably become familiar with the chat box uh, having done many webinars yourself i'm sure and the chat box what we expect is people to interact there uh, please put your comments there suggestions there there have been instances where the audience have interacted between themselves there have nice suggestions come up there and that's also a format to post your questions and we will track those questions and open it up at the uh, uh, once the formal talks are over and you can then speak yourself we will ask you to turn your mic on uh, but the other thing to do in the chat box and also later on is regarding the cpd and as you know the royal college of surgeons has kindly awarded us one cpd uh, but we do need to maintain a register for this so you kindly email us i will be putting the emails on there intermittently and uh, if you could email us your email addresses your affiliations and your name Uh, then we can maintain a register and you can self certify yourself for the one cpd um so without wasting any more time i think ali can i please request you to introduce our three speakers today and then kick the session off formally hi right. hello uh, thank you very much vivek my name is ali mehdi and i'm an orthopedic surgeon based in scotland those of you who've uh, come to this webinar for the first time um before i introduce the speakers i think it's very important to talk about the core of uh, this program um we have been running the series of webinars so that we can generate some hope and resilience amongst the medical community uh, we are all working in a very stressful environment very much out of our comfort zone and some of us actually are not working in our usual environments we are finding that we are covering other disciplines now as doctors a lot is taught on the scientific aspect of practicing medicine maybe not enough is being taught about the non technical side of how you deal with yourself with others including patients and colleagues and this is at a sort of you know very stressful time now the royal college of surgeons of edinburgh have had a program for many years uh that is that focuses on non technical skills so it is my huge huge privilege to actually welcome the bells are going off that um organizes the non technical skills training at the Royal College of Surgeons including individuals who have actually put in if you like the pioneering work on non technical aspects uh, behind medicine just before i again introduce but before i introduce our, our colleagues i'd like to say that so far we have covered um areas that include the self and the team on how one works effectively and how uh the team in general would work in a low resource environment so we will be discussing the operational aspect about how do you actually function what is the framework effectively in a team in the context which find us so we've got Simon Patterson Brown a general surgeon of uh, many years standing trainer to some of you even in this call you know um, who has extensively taught non technical skills steven you is a is uh, works at the university of edinburgh and is a specialist in behavioral science he's also worked in harvard and we've got with us an ex forces man nathan smith who is currently a research fellow in behavioral science as well and all these people put together i'm pretty certain will give you an extremely good overview of how we apply ourselves in a stressful environment simon over to you thank you very much ali so this is about non technical skills under pressure um we've been working for a long time at the college of surgeons in edinburgh they have uh, sponsored a lot of our work at what 
are the behavioral non-technical skills that improve our surgical performance? And it's widened out now to include other specialties, other disciplines, and other areas of the clinical domain. We work very closely with um, NHS Education for Scotland, that's Paul Bowie, and the university. And there is a, a book here that we've produced, um, basically from Steve Yule's research over the last 15 years on what are the non technical surgeons, what surgical. There are many other taxonomies, and we'll give you a link at the end of where you can find these taxonomies for your own specialty. Primarily, these are related to conventional um, areas of um, clinical practice, but increasingly they're coming out of the theatre domain and they're going into endoscopy, they're going to emergency department, and so on. How people behave and interact with each other. This is the, the, the non-technical skills for surgeons. Uh, this was a, a young Steve Yuley, looking a bit older now, but you'll see him in a minute. Steve identified that there were two groups of non-technical skills. There was the cognitive skills, the situation awareness and decision-making, how we understand what is going on around us, gathering information, understanding the information, and then anticipating what might happen, how we make a decision, based on that information. And then our social skills, which we'll probably talk a little bit more about today, our ability to communicate with other members of the team and our leadership skills within that team. They're all very important. We have at the moment, in fact, all areas of clinical practice, when we are affected by stress, this reduces our thinking space, what we call, or what the psychologists call our working memory, our ability to think, our cognition. But we are not so good at situation awareness. The, our, our, our thinking memory, our, our working memory is filled up by stress and all the things going on around us. This reduces our decision-making ability. It also affects how we communicate with our, uh, our colleagues, and therefore, it can break up our teamwork. And I know that both uh, Nathan and, and Steve are going to talk about that further. And we also need to identify that we are all leaders within the team at different times of the day, the, of, of our operation, of procedure, whatever we're doing, we will have different activities in relation to who's leading what around that time. But what we need to remember from today is that stress impacts um, our non-technical skills, and we need to look at that closely so that we can address that in order to... This is a, a, a diagram of the what we would call the operating theater team. As many people know, we tend to work in silos, surgery, nursing, anesthetics. And in the hospital, of course, there are multiple departments. And the problem is, how well do we all work together? And the idea here is to, is to look at some of those skills, because we need to break down the barriers between these silos in order to improve the coordination, operation, and the performance in order to improve the outcome uh, and the performance of the team. We have an opportunity during the day, every day at work, to use our non-technical skills and our behaviors to improve teamwork, which we may discuss in more detail later on. A daily briefing at the beginning of the day. We use checklists a lot in the operating theater, but increasingly they're used elsewhere. We should be debriefing more after each procedure, operation, ward round, um, shifts within um, the the emergency department and we can be briefing at the end of the day so that we can identify any issues issues that went well that everybody needs to be but we need to needs at all times and it is the whole team who's important here because it's the patient who's at the center of our work can't work safely then we won't be able to work properly but neither will the patient have a good outcome? 
And all of this requires communication. And again, we're going to be dealing with that in a little bit more detail. So remember, in relation to communication and teamwork, it's not what, what we don't say causes harm to the patients rather than what we do say. And there are many times when we don't speak when we know we should, or we think we should, we need to work in an environment where everybody is happy to speak up in order to improve the overall team's communication and coordination. So I'm gonna hand over now to Nathan Smith, um, who you've already introduced to. Nathan kindly has come on board here, um, from Manchester, and he is running the blog, which is, uh, you've got a link at the top, Link again at the end, which has got some great work in relation to a lot of areas of non technical skills. So, Nathan, over to you. Thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, so it, I was very kindly invited by Simon and Steve to join the, the webinar um, and to share a little bit about what we've been doing um, related to COVID 19. So, just before the lockdown came into effect in the UK, so this was a few weeks ago now. We were asked by some colleagues at the University of Manchester um, from the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute. Um, so Professor Paul Dark, who works in intensive care, um, linked us up with some psychologist colleagues at Salford Royal Hospital. And the, the purpose of our activity was really to develop some rapid training and education around some of these non-technical skills um, that could be used to really help support and get people up to speed with the best evidence base in, in these areas that's currently available now. Um, this activity was really designed as a, a refresher. Um, so it was, was kind of designed to complement rather than replace people's knowledge. You know, people are already doing lots of good stuff, but what we really wanted to do was to get some rapid material to the front line um, to make sure that we can cover some of the bases um, that might be helpful for managing some of the environments and situations that people find themselves in whilst tackling um, COVID-19. The reason for doing this is because, like Simon said, it's a very stressful situation. Um, healthcare workers, are, as, as you know, are, are used to operating under pressure, but actually this, this situation has some unique features that mean that that stress is potentially ramped up um, and that can have an impact on performance um, and health, both individually and at, at the team level. Um, so do you want to move to the slide, next slide, Simon? So if, you, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the materials we've produced, we have uploaded everything, um, so it's open source, at supporttheworkers.org. Um, we cover a range of non-technical skills. Steve's going to talk about the, the team dynamics um, stuff a little bit later, but we also cover a range of other factors. So things like psychological safety, um, this is important when people might be working outside their specialties and they might be making mistakes potentially, so making sure that people are comfortable and supported, um, readiness, optimizing sleep, um, a range of kind of issues that might be relevant to some of the work that you're doing. And you can go and have a look at that um, at your leisure. But the, the thing I'd like to focus on really is that the stress and stuff. So if we can move to the next slide, Simon. We, we know that this, this situation has created a number of demands that might have already been in place, but um, are raised in their significance. Um, so people might be struggling due to lack of sleep. You know, they're having to do quite, quite um, full on rotors, routines, um, consecutive shifts that might limit the time for sleep, especially if departments are stretched. This can result in tiredness and fatigue. Um, we might start to see over time this kind of repetition effect where people are having to do the same tasks over and over again, um, which has implications for maintaining performance. Due to the demand, there might be little time for nutrition and, and getting fluids on board. So hunger and dehydration might be um, a problematic. There are unique aspects to this situation. So the, the demand to wear protective equipment and the burden that that poses might be unusual for many people um, working on the front line. Um, and that can complement and add to, to some of the, the stresses and demands. There's obviously threat and danger to their own, their own safety. So. Um, you might be at risk of contracting the virus and that might create some of its own psychological challenges. And then socially, we know that in these high pressure situations, um, teams can sometimes find the, the interdependence, so the reliance on each other um, challenging, you know, having to 
be reliant on each other for safety and decision making um, can pose its own difficulties. And I think something that Ali and Simon both touched on was bringing people together from different specialties, um, especially people are moving in to do work outside of their normal area that they, they come with their own cultural um, kind of baggage that they've um, been trained within. Um, and that can create tensions as well. So there's these, there's these extreme stresses. In and of themselves, these things aren't necessarily destructive. Um, people can mostly cope with many of these things alone, but it's when we start clustering them together um, into kind of cluster effects and we combine these stresses that actually it can cause um, more problems. Um, so if you just want to move to the next slide, Simon. So we know, I mean, already we've, we've found, and I don't think I need to emphasize this really, but already we're starting to see stories of people on the front line um, finding the, the mental and physical aspects of responding to the COVID-19 uh, virus outbreak challenging. And I think over the, the, the coming weeks and months, these things are, are likely to, to become more prevalent and we might start to see more stories like this. Um, and what you'll notice in this, this kind of title here is that some of this is to do with the individual, but it's shaped by other factors um, that might be occurring at the social and political level. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a, in a second in the next slide. So if we can move just, just to the following slide. So what, what I'm really interested in, what this webinar um, is, is kind of focused on is this idea of resilience. Um, and this is a topic that myself and colleagues have been doing quite a lot of work in uh, military expedition, kind of high risk, high pressure settings. Um, and current research really emphasizes that resilience is not a fixed trait but it's something that's quite dynamic. Um, and it'd be really, we can consider it a dynamic process of adaptation to stresses and adversity, like those stresses we looked at at the previous slide. Resilience has a, what we call a biopsychosocial basis. So it has a, a biological, a psychological and a social component to it. And those things will interact. Um, this means that if there's deterioration in one area, like in the physiological aspects, this will impact on kind of emotions and mood, the affective component, um, and the social and cognitive function and vice versa. Um, the way I like to kind of describe this intersection of these um, nodes, the physiological, affective, social and cognitive is like they're all like glasses of water. Um, and if, if you get a stressor that starts to tip the water, you might lose some. Um, if you get an earthquake, which might represent all those stresses combined, one of those glasses tips over and all the water falls out. And then that knocks the other glasses over. And eventually if those stresses continue, you have deterioration in all those aspects. And that's when we might start seeing some significant problems. Um, so what we can try and do is optimize the components of this resilience network, either intervening socially, cognitively, affectively, or physiologically to maintain that function over the long period of time. Um, we know there are certain factors that can do that. So things like flexibility, reappraising situations, um, and what Steve's gonna talk about in a second, non-technical skills can offer a bridge between the resilience and performance. So we think non-technical skills when developed well, actually like Simon pointed out earlier, can intersect with the social and cognitive aspects of our function, which should help boost this resilience to, to the stressful situations we might find ourselves in and enable our performance and health to, to kind of be sustained over um, the, the challenges we face now and in the coming weeks and months. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll hand over to, to Steve who will talk a bit more about the team dynamics. Okay, thanks, Nathan, and, and all for inviting us this evening. So I'd like to take on the, the final leg of, of this, um, this three-person um, webinar. Uh, talk a little about team dynamics, non-technical skills, and if you can flip to the next slide, please, Simon. The aim here really is to, is to describe some of, the, some of the advice, some practical tips, trying to distill some of the research evidence that we have into things you can actually do at the sharp end. Um, and if you look at the Support the Workers website, which I know Nathan has really been has been pioneering in, this has got a, a whole load of excellent one um, one sided fact sheets, uh, tips that you can use and actually practically implement, discuss with your colleagues. So I so encourage you to look at that website. Um, I'm actually going to go through some of the team dynamics aspects that we think could be useful here. Simon, next slide, please. And, and the aim is really to, to look at three or four different concepts that could be helpful in, in the next 10 minutes. One is to really focus around non-technical skills. Think about closed loop communication and how that as a tool might be helpful if you're working with people who you don't know or haven't met before or um, have very limited working relationship with can be helpful to enhance performance. 
We're going to look at some simulation studies to see how real teams perform under stress. Might give us an indication of the of the types of of vulnerabilities that, that we have and things we could do to, to solve them. And then look at a couple of, of interesting environments that actually are used to dealing with uncertain and variable amounts of resources for medical care. So some research I've uh, been doing with colleagues for a number of years in Rwanda, looking at, at surgery in Rwanda as a variable resource setting, and then also looking at, at healthcare on, on space missions and future missions to Mars, which is a fixed low resource. And so, so we could actually learn a little about how healthcare is delivered in those, in those resource constrained environments. Um, next slide, Simon. And so simulation is, is really where I've done a lot of my research. This is the psychologist's dream, looking through a one-way glass to see a team in action performing in an almost real environment. And so a, a lot of the framing for the next few minutes is around this. So these are real data from real healthcare professionals working in an almost real environment, certainly a psychologically real environment. And here the observer here is using a non-technical skills framework to observe and debrief a team um, after some crisis surgery, which I think is not necessarily the, the setting that we're looking at just now, but we're certainly looking at a crisis situation and the, the normal rules of engagement don't apply. And so we need to think of tools to support each other and to support teams to, to learn and perform at, at our, our highest level. Next slide, Simon. And so I'm going to talk first of all about closed loop communication. If you could hit forward once. Um, so closed loop communication is a tool that comes from the military. It's actually used to great effect in different settings. It's not mandated, I don't think, in any surgical setting, but actually has, has some use. And it's a way of structuring communication to try and reduce communication errors or misunderstandings or information that's critical that is dropped. Um, and so here, it actually has three phases. Uh, the first phase is the call out. So here the surgeon is saying to the anesthesiologist, John, please activate the massive transfusion protocol and forward one. And you'll see the anesthesiologist checks back and says, yes, I'm calling them now. And then click forward one more time. And then the surgeon confirms that by saying, great, let me know when you start transfusing. And that actually opens the next loop of communication. And this is helpful for a couple of reasons. One, it allows some very structured communication around task critical um, information here. Oh. And we would not use this for every single communication episode. That would be very tiresome and, and prolonging. But this allows to have a sort of shared mental model about what's happening and to allow error, error uh, reduction. And it also reduces the cognitive load here. So the surgeon who asked for that actually is not waiting for a response. The anesthesiologist oh hasn't um, triggered the massive transfusion protocol, but, um, hasn't, but then hasn't told the rest of the team. So there's, there's a lack of uncertainty about what's happening for those situations. Next slide, Simon. And so we also looked at the, the impact of this type of, of structured non-technical <laughs> communication in, in simulated crisis scenarios. And here, I won't go through the figure here in a lot of detail, but you can find the reference and happy to talk about it in the discussion. But we found that the performance of the team in terms of crisis resolution time, both for a hemorrhage emergency and a difficult airway emergency, better non-technical skills rated by independent raters were, were uh, significantly related to better performance in terms of clinically relevant outcomes for patients in these simulations. So it's not just about being polite or, or saying please and thank you. These are about about um, failing or uh, reducing failures of communication and, and teamwork in, in safety critical environments. Next slide, Simon. The, the next concept I think could be useful is directed and non-directed communication. And this is particularly helpful if you're working in teams where you don't know people or you don't know their level of competence or you are actually used to leading people in, uh, in your clinical setting, but suddenly are in a situation where you are a follower or a team member and you're actually being led by somebody else. Actually really helpful. And that's a, that's a very unusual situation, I think, for a lot of senior clinicians um, and during COVID-19 response. And so if you click forward one, Simon, um, directed communication, as you might expect, is information that's targeted using either a name, usually name, or role, uh, eye contact, and occasionally physical contact, you might tap someone on the shoulder if that's appropriate. And that's contrasted with non-directed, if you click forward one. 
non-directed communication, same information, but it's not targeted to somebody specific. And we have run a number of simulations and, and gathered data on a huge number of, of communication patterns and found that directed communication is about three times more likely in, in eliciting a response. So if you use somebody's name, role, eye contact, or occasionally physical contact, you're much more likely to get a response from that person. And the, the, the non-directed though, actually is what teams use quite frequently. So people shout things into the air or, or offer commands, air commands, or my, my friend John Scott likes to call this spray and pray communication, where you actually hope somebody is gonna hear the message and act on it. It does happen in, in about 15 to 20% of, of cases, but it's a very inefficient way of, of, of trying to, to deal um, with, with a team, especially during a, a time sensitive crisis. Next slide, Simon. And we find actually here in, a, in a, a, an emergency situation, so this is a, a, a PEA arrest in a, in a post-surgical patient, we find that the, the teams um, flip from using non-directed communication, that's their usual style, to after about 100 seconds into an emergency, start to use much more directed communication styles. And so we've done some analyses to show that these communication styles actually um, are related to, to how well patients do uh, during, during um, rare events, crises in, in their lives. Next slide, Simon. Now, the, the one thing that um, all of this research and, and knowledge is, is on is based on very high resource, luxurious medical environments in, in, the, in the US, Western Europe, and, and so on. Um, actually, there are completely different healthcare settings that we can learn a lot from in terms of how teams perform during variability in terms of resources. One of these is Rwanda. If you, if you forward the slide again once. Um, so this is surgery in Rwanda, an image from Robert Ruffiello, who's a surgeon I work with at, at the Brigham in Harvard. And, and this is actually two, um, two patients um, receiving surgical care in the same operating room. The, the two different teams here are sharing the lights the, the suture is locked in the chair of surgery's office drawer. It's a very constrained um, a variable resource environment. And so actually teams have developed some adaptive responses to this that I think could be really helpful in this situation. Next slide, please. And we, we've distilled a lot of this into uh, a set of contextual challenges and really concept contextual challenges to do with resource variability, such as equipment and materials, staff variability like provider training and um, communication so in, in Rwanda there is English, Kin Rwandan and French and so you can hear those different languages spoken in the same operating theatre um, and also in terms of systems variability, ability to respond and uh, facilities and so on. Now I'm sure that you are looking at these four contextual challenges and thinking isn't this exactly what we've had in terms of the of the a discussion around COVID-19 and being able to support the NHS in terms of the variability, in terms of training, resources, equipment, responsiveness, and so on. So I actually think there's a lot to learn from, from context who, who have this as their normal mode of operation in terms of behaviours. Um, and we have a number of courses and non-technical skills for these variable resource contexts uh, run in Rwanda, supported by Johnson & Johnson and the, and the College of Surgeons. And Ejid Abahuji, Robert Riviello, um, Wendy Williams, and, and others have been have been dealing and developing these. Next slide, please. And the final environment I think could be helpful to look at is is the spaceflight environment. This is a fixed um, low resource setting. Uh, we've had some a uh, couple of grants to look at non technical skills for astronauts and for uh, ground control, mission control. And um, next slide, please. And this is particularly interesting. Um, for a number of reasons, that the, the team are not all medically trained to, to the same level. There could be one or two um, physician level trained personnel on a future Mars mission, but there'll be geologists and physicists and, and other, other, other expertise there. There are a number of um, medical conditions that, that could occur and require good non-technical skills to recognize. For example, pneumothorax, so early recognition, um, and then a fairly basic technical skill of needle decompression. Um, other things like an eye blast injury, so protecting crew from floating debris, keeping calm, thinking about psychological resilience. And then events that, that affect the whole team, such an ammonia gas leak, 
um, and situations where the, the leader has to trade off decisions about risk to crew or risk to the medical personnel and risk to the to the mission. And I think this is an interesting situation to look at the behavioral skills for astronauts to deal with medical events in these in these resources. And we've actually developed a whole taxonomy like knots for astronaut crews. So it has a lot of behavioral skills um, to, to do with managing events working well in a, in a team and being able to set expectations on goals and listening to concerns of, of team members, making uh, decisive decisions, um, looking at non-verbal communications and so on. Next slide, please. Just to say we can, can teach this in Edinburgh University as a whole master's program in patient safety and clinical human factors that has a lot of this content. And there are other resources. Next slide, please. Resources that could be helpful here for you. Um, I, I, we described Simon described the knots resources on the on the Royal College of Surgeons website. There's the support of the workers briefing notes that, that Nathan's pioneered. Uh, the NES in in Scotland have a whole series of human factors resources. Um, Clinical human factors group Martin Bromley. Uh, through his his leadership has has really uh, driven uh, a whole culture of understanding about these factors and how they can affect performance. And I think that we are now seeing at this very moment in time that these these skills are coming to the fore. We need them during times of calm, when during relatively routine elective surgery and elective uh, situations. But actually, we also need them during crises, both at an individual patient level and also at a capacity and system level. And so with that, I'll pass back to Ali and Vivek. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Simon, Nathan, and Steve. So I think key home, the key take home messages here, can everybody hear me? Could you please confirm? Yeah. The key take home messages here from Simon were that stress reduces thinking capacity. It reduces awareness decision-making ability, and leadership. Resilience, according to Nathan, is a dynamic process, a process in which uh, you successfully adapt to external stresses. And external stresses, like he very eloquently explained, are often like glasses. Uh, if you lose the balance between cognitive uh, skills and um, effective skills, social skills, and psychological skills, very often that is what takes you down the abyss of not being able to cope. But thank you very much, Stephen, in explaining the role of directed communication, especially in the sort of teams that we are working with uh, now, uh, multi-purpose, multidisciplinary teams that we've not been used to working with. So as you put it, uh, name, naming people um, by either the name or the role, maintaining eye contact and some form of physical, appropriate physical contact is often very useful. So um, do we have any questions? Yes, I think there have been a few. The chat box has been busy, I suppose. Um, Matt, are there any particular ones that you wanted to pick up on? Matt's our co-organizer, who is a spine surgeon in London and actually the head of training, recruitment and education at the newly built Nightingale Hospital. Matt, Hello everyone. Hi, hi Matt. Come in please. Hello everyone, welcome. So one of the key themes that I heard today was that of team psychological safety. And that's the feeling that everyone can speak up and be heard. And I mention it because that's one of the key underlying philosophies of our new Nightingale Hospital where flattened hierarchies mean that the normal steep hierarchical NHS system where you have people at the top and then workers at the bottom is being flattened so that everyone is at the same level. But it's a difficult thing to achieve in the NHS. Psychological safety is the belief that everyone can be heard and that if there's a problem they can speak up and that those problems can be identified and then solutions found. And it's, it's the basis of a safe learning environment. So my question is to the individuals who discuss psychological safety, how true is that in terms of practice and implementability in the NHS? 
because we hear about it a lot, but I've not really noticed it's, it's, it's um, should we say, practically used at the grassroots level. Should I take that one on, guys? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so psychological safety, I think, I mean, I, I was following the chatbot discussion a little bit and, and sort of picking up on a few, few points. I think there's a couple of components to, to psychological safety. Some of it's embedded in culture, um, which will develop through uh, people having a mindset that's targeted towards emphasizing that safety. And I think, you know, that, that's, that's something that might not be able to be rapidly achieved without buy-in from lots of different people. Um, so I think leadership really has a role there for emphasizing, okay, people will make mistakes during this, this COVID-19 crisis. Under stress, we, it's normal for us to make mistakes. Um, and it's putting policies in place. So writing down um, and, and giving people structured guidelines to enact the psychologically safe culture. Um, I think without that, it, it's quite difficult to actually get something embedded that people can, can really follow. If, if, it's, if it's a sort of whimsical, um, you know, we, we talk about psychological safety, but no one really knows what, what, what we do or how we enact it, then I don't think it will spread um, throughout a, a system like, like the NHS. So Nathan, just, just tell me, so for the people listening, yeah. who are gonna go back to their workplaces, maybe their office desktops, working in their little teams, what advice would you give to them to try and create a more, should we say, productive learning environment where psychological safety can be used? Because they may go back to their offices and go, oh my goodness me, my boss never lets me do anything. I can never get heard and I can't actually voice my ideas, some of which may actually be helpful. So what little practical tips could you give our listeners today that they can take back to their workplaces and maybe try and create that more productive learning environment. Yeah, I mean, so when I say leadership, I mean everyone can take a leadership role, and I think that's this is the point that I'm going to make. Is if you go back to your own workspace, you can take the lead in creating those norms around psychological safety. So you can get together with the group of people you're working with and establish what a psychologically safe culture would be like for you in your small groups that you're working with, and write them down. Um, write down what it is so people can go somewhere and see these things listed and know actually if a mistake happens these are the things that we will do to make sure this safe culture is created um, so so there's a real clear guideline there for actually you know what what is it what sort of behaviors what sort of ways of interacting will we you know adopt to create this culture that's safe psychologically um, so you know, errors can be seen as learning opportunities rather than um, recrimination options, um, I guess is the key point. I think that's great, Nathan, if I could add to that as well. The, the leadership also has to come from the top as well. So if people speak up, um, the, the people that, that um, receive the message have to treat them with respect, they have to listen. And the critical thing is what happens if somebody speaks up and they're wrong? What do the leaders do then? How do they, how do, that's, the, that's your cultural point that can really have a huge impact because people hear the message, they ripple down very fast. And so treating people with respect is important. And you know, the other thing is about ego as well. And that we, if, if we, we can't do things personally. So if somebody uses direct communication with you, you have to get personally, you have to think about the task and you have to set the ego aside. And the third thing that an individual person could do is you have to really all of your belief and you have to um, acknowledge that you're not 100% correct about everything. And so, so if you can start to understand that, that you are fallible as well and you have things to learn, that actually opens your mindset um, and quite broadly. So your, your first reaction becomes less defensive and more about learning. And as a cultural thing, I think that's really important. So there's some grassroots and some top-down things that people can do. Right, fantastic. Thank you, Steve and Nathan. Um, do we have any more questions from the floor? Thank you, Stephen. I think uh, just on that basis, I think Samira Nikpur had asked already, and uh, maybe she can ask herself, but how does a leader actually monitor how their team is coping with the stresses? What are the cues and what are the kind of markers where Hello, Samira, <laughs> please ask yourself, you might be able to explain it better even. So, oh, she's so much. Uh, 
so the question was, how do they manage for this? Um, is that the question? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Is that again? Yes, Sorry. that's the question you posted on the chat box, didn't you? I think, uh, I think team building is really important, not being scared and not being frightened and having a proper conversation with your colleague. Um, and creating a, a example in, when I was a trainee, we used to have a um, at the end of the day and the beginning of the day. Um, but I'm a GP now, so it's a little bit different. I'm mainly on my own. Um, so I think in a hospital setting, uh, it's just uh, bringing, building that trust and respect. So, and if a colleague is bullied or someone is bullied, then they can, uh, some another colleague can help them. When I got bullied, I got really badly bullied. I used to go to the toilet and I used to cry. I cried out. Um, and that kind of continued for about until I did it. So I think that's not the way to deal with, uh, with this. I think there should be more support. Um, I think, um, and then they asked me, was that person bullying you? I said, no because I didn't want them to lose their job. So, um, but I think uh, it's a very difficult question. I don't know, you and you're more senior than me. You probably know a lot more than me. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I think we have experts here to answer your question and add to that. Uh, would Simon uh, want to say I'd something? Pick, Sounds pick like. That, Thank you. Um, I've been looking through the chat. This question is, is, is in other areas as well. And it's all about what does someone do if they think that the older person might be in a direction that some of the younger um, trainees may not want to go. And they may have ideas that um, some of the traditional people don't want to take forward and they may not listen. And I think it goes back to what Steve was talking about in relation to his communication and what we talked about earlier in the non-technical skills is need in particularly moments like this but actually every day we need a brief at the beginning of every day so that we know the names of the team we know who we're working with and of course in some areas we're working with people in gowns and masks and, and visors and people can't recognize each other they don't know who they are so we need to know everybody in the team we need to know what position they're all in we've got a lot of more junior doctors coming on now and i think it's 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 really important that Everybody in the team can, can say something and speak up. Everybody needs to be able to support the others. And there are times when there's a lot of stress going on. And if we don't speak at the beginning of the day and know who we are and know what our positions are, during the course of the day, we may struggle. And it's, and it's as, as important for the elderly consultant who may think they're the leader the, the youngest person in the team or the most experienced that actually they can speak together about their problems. I think uh, Matt gave a really good question right at the beginning. What do you do when you all go back to your workplace? I think we all need to speak of the day and when you go back, say to the rest of your team, let's just sit down for 10 minutes and let's have a discussion about what we're going to do today. Simon, I could add, add a bit to that. Also, for Samira's point here, I mean, the, the, the problem is that you can't create a culture um, immediately. So in terms of monitoring those kind of behaviours, that, that ship has sailed now to do anything. Although Matthew is doing amazing work in terms of the culture at, at the Nightingale. That is, that's incredible. And often, it takes big organisations, and let's just this organisation, it takes some things out a, a disaster to change behavior and change practices. And we always talk about, wouldn't it be great if we could actually change things for the better without the need for an industrial accident or, or something like that? Never point to, to change culture for good and change practices for good. I think, I think it's important that we don't lose sight of this. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Mary Salama. Can I invite you to ask your question yourself? Can you hear me, Mary? Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm hey. gatecrashing your surgical webinar as a paediatrician. Um, I find that I do a lot of things um, 
communication is very ad hoc. So you might talk to somebody by a coffee machine or in an office and those moments no longer exist because everyone is socially distancing. So how do you recreate that within wider teams that aren't acutely on the shop floor? Thank you, Mary, for your question. But the first things first, this is not a surgical meeting at all. You're very welcome. We are cross-discipline, not just medics even. So please, please do join us next time as well. Um, Thank you. Right. Who would want to take that question up? Uh, anyone? Stephen or Nathan or Simon? Oh, I'll, I'll chip something in if, if that's okay, Vivek. Yes, absolutely, Nathan, please. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a really good point. I, I think there's, there's been a lot of um, adaptation, not just in the healthcare um, system, but people having to adjust to digital working and i think that's this is something impacting obviously obviously your, your role as well um mary so um, i think although there's going to be challenges i think trying to find the other opportunities for integrating some of those light touch social conversations so if there are kind of debrief going on can, can some of that be tagged into into those conversations so you've got some activity but you can follow it with some slightly more informal um communication aspects um, I think there may well need to be some more kind of structured there. So, you know, adding buddy systems in, that's something that we've been talking to, to organizations about. So making sure people know who their key social support networks are, and that might be one, two or three people that they know they can go to and have those kind of light conversational um, times. Um, just, just so people aren't kind of floundering and not really knowing what to do, but they've got some kind of key you know, people that are available to them and that they've been agreed that they'll they'll be there kind of studies for that support system that's in place. I don't know whether that might work for you, but um, that's something that we've been discussing, not just in the healthcare system, but with other groups. No, that's really helpful. Thank you. Vic, there's an interesting question on the chat line about someone who wants to put his meet Aru. Do we have key points to consider for pre-procedural team briefings, specifically related to PPE and when are people are using PPE? And the answer is absolutely we do. We have briefings before all procedures and all sort of sessions, whether they be interventional sessions and endoscopy, theater, ward rounds and whatever. And we find out who we're working, particularly when we're working in gowns and masks and everything. So the first thing is the surgical safety checklist, which has come out a long time ago, and finding out who we're working with, what are we going to do, how are we going to do it, and what are the experiences of the people in the team. And we're doing that all the time now, and it allows everybody to speak up a little bit and flattens the hierarchy. So good question there, and we have got the facilities to do that. Our main question was we're literally, as I've said, trying to design a, a way of actually conducting a briefing separate to what we'd normally do in surgery. Um, and we're just trying to think of the barriers given that the communication that we normally rely upon is not going to be, you know, as, as easy given that we're in PPEs. So we're thinking about alternatives such as cues, doing part of the checklist outside of the room. Um, you know, how do we consider sort of signaling and these kinds of things? We're not quite sure. We're sort of starting from scratch. And we're just wondering if anyone's thought about this already in and in surgery so we don't reinvent the wheel. And if we could share those resources, I've sent my email, that would be great. I mean, really you want exactly what we're doing at the minute, but you have to break it down a little bit because some people will be outside the room, some people will be inside the room. First thing is name badges. Um, and the anesthetists are very good at that, and writing their name on their, on their hats and, writing, uh, and having badges so that you know who you're speaking to when you put masks and, and visors on. And, and I think we should do that more often. Um, particularly we work well with people, as soon as they put a mask and a visor on, we don't recognize them anymore. So I think that's a, a good thing to start with. But as far as the others go, I think we're learning as we go. I just, I just say on that point, the, from the, the non-verbal communication side, there, there might be some lessons learned from particularly some of the defense and security contexts that I've been working in, in the past, where teams are, are going into areas where they might be wearing gas masks and another a kit, and they're having to rely on hand gestures and signals um, to get key bits of information across. And that's not overloading, but that might be five or six kind of key hand signals that communicate the really critical information. 
um, that there's probably some lessons that could be learned from that. If, if I can find something and, and dig it out, I'll, I'll try and circulate that. Um, that might be helpful. Simon, I have a question. I think the session has been excellent today. It's a real shame that the my computer failed a bit, but I did apply situational awareness, decision making, a bit of team working with my son's help, and a bit of leadership as well to continue with this webinar. Um, my question is um, what is the situation in regards to NHS trust giving? focus on non-technical skill training. I mean, how much penetration has the world college had in this respect? Um, I have difficulty hearing that, um, Ali. Uh, but I think you were asking about how much do hospitals have in trying to develop non-technical skills training compared with a college? Yes, how much penetration does the college have? Well, the college deals with fellows, um, members, um, throughout the world. Uh, it doesn't deal with the hospital, individual hospitals. Training programs are now set up and run. Um, a, a lot of programs for non-technical skills training for trainees. This is primarily surgical specialties um, and, uh, and anesthetists do it as well. But the other specialties really haven't started doing it yet. But that's on the training program rather than on the hospital-based program. But what I think is gonna come in over the next um, few years is team-based training in hospitals. And that's getting teams together within hospitals to um, understand the communication, teamwork, leadership, skills that allow teams to work better. And we've started doing team-based training programs um, around the UK and overseas. Um, and in America, I've, I've done a lot of them. Um, and I think that is the area of the future where hospitals can take on team-based training. There's no point in training one or two people in non-technical skills. You need the whole team to understand them. And that's on an individual hospital basis. But we haven't got there yet, but it is something that hopefully will come in, in over the next few years. I mean, there appears to be that need for a culture or for that sort of training, doesn't there? Um, which unfortunately hasn't been embraced. And like I said earlier, there is um, a massive amount of non-technical work that we do as doctors, and yet that does not appear to have been recognized uh, in, our, in our training uh, leading up to where we are. We need to change the culture. And hopefully in times of stress like this, more people will understand that it is a cultural change that we need to go. Martin Bromley has been very good at driving that forward with the clinical human factors group and lots of other areas are now doing it look at what nathan's doing from relatively a non-medical side of things but is so relevant to high stress situations which we have in medicine the culture doesn't um doesn't change like that the culture is really like the sum of all the behaviors and practices and norms of behavior and so on and so it really starts from from the from what you do, so you can't really say we're going to change culture and put in a culture change program because that, that I don't see how that's going to work. I'd say one of the examples that I think could be really helpful is the is the Rwandan and uh, non technical skills. So we've now run five or six workshops in different different parts of Rwanda, district hospitals. We actually changed the whole paradigm to focus on the whole team, includes everyone in the whole team, um, and the, and rewriting the whole curriculum. Uh, to do that and so I think they, they, they started with looking at what's the resource uh, variability and um, what are the skills that are required and that's like a grassroots movement that is that is focused on non-technical skills for the team in different district hospitals uh, we can actually learn a lot from them in terms of actually uh, of, of how we want to do it in, in different um, resource rich or high income contexts. Fantastic I'd like to thank Simon, Steve, um, and Nathan for joining us uh, on behalf of Vivek and Matt. I'd like to remind everyone that next Wednesday, Wednesday the 6th of May, we, our next session is about understanding one's own personality and the personality of the team and how to deal with it. So we have an excellent speaker, Anderson Hurst, who teaches at Warwick Prison School, and he'll be talking about different personality types, broadly dividing them into yellow, green, red, and yellow, so that we can all see where we are 
where our teams lie and how best do we deal with the individual individuals in the team, especially in the context of this very stressful environment of COVID-19. So I'd like to thank one and everybody uh, for joining us today. Uh, there have been some technical glitches as always, and uh, I have to say that with the best non-technical skills, situation awareness, decision making, team working and leadership, we managed to get through this. A big thank you to all of you, and I hope you stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone, especially Simon, Nathan and Stephen. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.